When I was a kid, horror movies weren't nearly as gruesome as our horror movies are now. I don't go see horror movies because I'm a chicken and I don't really like to be afraid, but you know, I see trailers of them on TV and it's like, wow, you know, the whole zombie thing still just gives me the creeps. I'm just really creeped out. I'm not sure that zombie stuff is really horror movies, but when I was a kid, it was different. I mean, the horror movies made you use your imagination and and there were, the bad guy was always you know really evident who he was he'd have some dark eye makeup on and usually kind of hunched over and has this really sinister look on his face and if he was like a vampire or something you wouldn't actually see him you know bite the lady's neck that was way too graphic you know but what would happen is there would be a scream and the camera would shift to something else, you know, and you were left to your own imagination as to what was going on there. And of course, you had nightmares even after you saw those things because when I was a kid, you know, it's the big exciting thing. You're like 9, 10, 11 years old and you get to go see a horror movie when mom's shopping or something. And, and so afterwards, you always had nightmares that just came as part of the tax that, you know, came with having to watch the being scared. And and so you want to sleep with the light on. And my parents were really just mean, mean, mean people. Uh, never could we have a light. And all of my friends had those little night lights that you plugged in, not my mom and dad, you know. And um, we were living in a second-story farmhouse that uh, had trees that were like alive on the outside of the house, and they would scratch on the windows, you know. And, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh pitch black except for the moon coming through the window and the trees scratch you get you know and you're like i'm gonna die up here and nobody's gonna know it and i remember when i got a little chrome flashlight with a red top on it i don't know if any of you you're you're all kids but anyway they used to make these little chrome flashlights and it was like i got my flashlight and i'd have it under my cover and so then, you know, they would start to get closer to my bed. I'd turn my light on. There's nothing there. I mean, they're fast. Just really, really fast, you know. But you knew they were there someplace in the room. But anyway, we still went to see the movies, you know. It's like, kind of like that whole scene, that scenario. What, what is it about fear that's exciting in some ways? I mean, is it the adrenaline that you get when you're afraid or, or maybe... Or maybe it's still kind of that make-believe thing that I can stop it because it's just a movie and I can walk out or I can stop this fear and we get that control high off of watching uh, fearful stuff. You know it makes a lot of money. Uh, look this up. Six Cents, the number one horror movie ever made. I didn't really think that was really that scary of a movie, but it made $293 million. That's a lot of money. Exorcist, the old time, you know, old school, was $232 million. There's a lot of money in fear because Hollywood's discovered that it doesn't cost a lot of money just to have a bunch of seconds, you know, and extras walking around like dead people. That doesn't cost a lot of money. You can pay those, you know, the, the labor union rate, and they can walk around and put some makeup on them, and that's it. It's pretty cheap stuff, but... It's And, you know, it's all pretend fear, right? It's all safe. It isn't like the real fear, which the real fear is, and maybe I'm the only guy that's ever done this, but you're wakened in the night and you're not sure if what you heard was a dream or is it somebody in the kitchen, you know? So Nina gives me my little chrome flashlight. <laughs> no, it doesn't go that way. I give it to her, I go, it's a dream, it's a dream, you know. If they get me, they get me, so what, you know. But uh, that's, that's probably why so many people think that it's entertaining to be afraid, is that it's make-believe. It, it isn't real, and I, I can leave at any time. But, but what about the real fears? I mean, I think that no one has to teach us how to be afraid. It just comes naturally to us. Just You, you look back on those fears when you were a kid, and they seem so silly now. I mean, and yet, at the time, they were so real. And I, I wish that I could go back, I think we all do, and, and do some of those years over, just part of them. I don't really want to be nine anymore, but if we could just do some of those things over, I'd do it differently. 
you know, like, like for me, it was the one I think of was my first time at bat and they didn't have, you know, bat or pitching machines and tees and stuff like that. They put the nine year old in the batter's box with a 12 year old giant <laughs> on the mound that, that was throwing heat, you know, and, and then you had to stand there. I would love to go back to the first time, you know, when I was in that batter's box because scared to death, all he had to do is look at you and you'd flinch, you know, you think he's going to hit me because he's hit other kids. He's kind of wild. And if I could just go back to that one moment and get in that batter's box and he throws one inside and I just take it right there on the side. You know, just thump. Don't even move out of the way. Just, just take one. You know, that's what I'd do. Just take a little bit of pain. It just hurts for a while. You know, you think he's, it's going to kill you, but it, he's, nobody's died, I don't think, from getting hit in the side. Well, maybe a few, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> get, get, getting hit in the side. So, so you just take it and lay the bat down. And the little nine-year-old looks at the 12-year-old as she walks slowly to first base. Think how that would change your life. Really, have you ever thought about this? I mean, all the other kids are sitting, all the other nine, ten-year-olds are sitting there on the little league bench, and they're going, wow, Van Zandt. Van Zandt, wow. He's definitely at the top of the heap of the nine-year-olds, probably the ten-year-olds. As a matter of fact, there's some dads that are sitting there and they're punching each other and go, that Van Zandt kid, man, he's got some guts. I hope my boy's watching. <laughs> Think how this would change it. When you take one, when you take one right now, take one in the side to move to the top of the heap of all the guys. That's all you got to do. Or it's like, you know, I don't know how many of you took swimming lessons, but it's swimming lessons. You know, you, you go all week and they maybe for weeks for years and you learn how to swim and it's all in this sinister plan because really what they're into is genocide of seven and eight year old kids is they get you there to the end of the swimming lessons and they go now you can swim you're going off the high dive right and you got to walk up that ladder you know they tell you that and you know it's high dive day and everybody's scrambling to get you know kids are getting sick I got a headache my dog's calling me all kinds of things but they don't want to be first if I had it to do over again I just go first to the line and just right climb up that ladder all the way to the top and and not be afraid at all and just go out to the end and I wouldn't jump and hold my nose like we all did I just did a great big old swan dive belly flop, right? And just get it over with. Just think about that. Just, just one moment of overcoming fear and knowing that the fear really isn't going to, what, the, the worst thing that could happen is really not going to hurt me for long. But I was afraid. How many of us, you know, weren't afraid? Fear comes so naturally to us Here's the definition of fear, an unpleasant feeling of anxiety caused by the presence or anticipation of danger. Today we live in the midst of, of so many fearful people and we have increasing reasons to fear. You can't watch the news without seeing things about uh, terrorists and Al-Qaeda cells and, and ISIS advancing and nuclear programs, you know, escalating and murders and shootings locally here. I mean, I, I didn't see the news this morning, but there had to be at least two or three convenience stores robbed last night because that's what happens every weekend now in our city. You watch the news and there are good reasons. I mean, there... There are layoffs and there are economic indicators that are, that are plummeting and politicians are lying and nations are warring and, and epidemics are happening. Ebola is coming and our food sources are all contaminated, you know, and on and on and on. Good morning, America. Get up and go to work. This is what's happening today. Have a nice day. And at the same time, if a man has an accident along the side of the road and totals his car and he's standing out along the road with blood all over him, everybody just drives on by because, I don't know, he, he, it, it might be a mass murderer that's disguised himself in a bloody car and, and abduct me and take me away. You know, everybody's afraid of everything. 
Fear is so common today. We, we fear of being sued, fear of being laid off, fear of going broke, of getting cancer. A simple mosquito bite, you know, might be West Nile and stranger danger. Our kids, you know, we, we even get them and we're afraid for them to ride on a bus. You can't get on a big yellow bus anymore because something might happen to you while you're on a bus. And we have alarms in our homes and on our cars and on our, you know, encryption on our computers and on our tablets. And danger is everywhere and it's getting closer. An Englishman began to document the increase in the media media's use of fear in order to get viewership and he counted the number of times the phrase at risk was used and he counted this is in 1994 way back then 20 years ago he counted two two thousand three hundred and sixty four times in the media that the phrase at risk was used by the end of the next year it had doubled by the end of 2000, just six years later, it increased to more than 18,000 times that the English media had used the phrase at risk. So in six years, the press had caught on to that if they lead a story with this is at risk today that people will watch because fear sells. It gets our attention. The news that leads with the sentence, oh, at six, a startling report about the dangers of sitting in traffic. And we go, really? Sitting in traffic now? I thought I was safe in my car. Now I can't even sit in traffic anymore. I need to worry about that today. But, but we live in a world that's just filled with fear because fear sells and becomes the natural toxin that, that we take in all the time. And, you know, fear never shares. Fear is a bully. Fear does not share with peace and contentment. It just, just can't have both at the same time. It doesn't give happiness any, any room at all. Fear is a bully and it wants your entire life. He's not going to share you. And fear will demand that you pay complete allegiance to him alone. You can't be creative at all. Fear never wrote a symphony. Fear never created a masterpiece. Okay, Fear never saved a marriage. Courage does those things. Faith does those things, but not fear. Fear hides and fear puts us in chains and fear is a killer and it kills our hope and it kills our love. And we are even becoming capable of caring about anybody else because we're so afraid that something's going to happen to us. Now, stop your rant, Don. Imagine a life that is absent of fear. Imagine a life. Imagine a mind that's clear. Imagine a life that's without the thought of what might happen. I mean, can we dream? Can, can we dream of a world like that? Um, Jesus says he's coming back to give us that kind of world. He's going to redeem this world that's actually controlled by fear and self-interest. He's going to change that world into a place where that dream becomes a reality but what about for ourselves personally? What if you had no fear about what others might think about you? What if, you know, how they might make fun of you? Or you might embarrass yourself. Um, how would you live if you knew that no matter what you did, it'd be good? It'd be just, just the right thing. How about a life that's lived completely without fear? A life where someone else was in control? You didn't have to worry about it anymore. You're no longer in control of all this because somebody else is in control and that somebody else is someone that you trust completely. He will always do what is the right thing. I mean, the kind of person that would encourage you to go up and, you know, face down those 12-year-olds and jump off the high dive without fear. See, here's the reality. In the same way that I look back today, and many of my fears as nine-year-olds seem so silly and ridiculous, I know, and you do too, that the time's going to come when we're going to look back upon this day and realize, what in the world was holding me back? What am I so, was I so afraid of? This was all rather silly. <laughs> it's, it's like the high dive. It's, it's, it's like standing in the batter's box. Why did I let that stop me? Why was I so afraid? 
Well, for these next few weeks, I want us to just kind of move there to envision a life of what it would mean to completely trust in the one who is in control, who said, don't be afraid. Just that simple. Don't be afraid. And, and this week, we want to use a passage of scripture that you probably know pretty well. It'll take a little time to go through it. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. And when he, that's Jesus, got into the boat, the disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Why are you afraid? Kidding this, Jesus? Why am I afraid? Man, we're out here in the middle of this lake in this little bitty boat, and there's a huge storm, and waves are coming over, and we're going to die out here. And Jesus, though, he's not kidding. He's not smiling while he does this. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? It says a great storm arose. Now, in English, we kind of miss the word great, you know, isn't, isn't, doesn't really convey what this is. Matthew uses the Greek word uh, seismos, and you can kind of get from that seismos, you know, how we use that word today. Um, he uses it, it's not really what we would call a storm. It, it's not a downpour, it's not a shower, it's seismic. The plates are shifting, it's huge. It's this gigantic storm, you know. Uh, Matthew used this word two other times. Um, uh, one time he used it of the earthquake that happened when Jesus died on Calvary. The second time that he used it, or really the third time he used it in, in his gospel, was um, to describe the shaking of the ground at the resurrection. So this is big stuff. Um, and here's Matthew, the landlubber, the, the former tax collector, and he's terrified of the waves that come over the side of the boat. And Jesus says, why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. <laughs> really? Wow. All the things you could have said to me right now, Jesus, you chose to say that. Now, they, they hadn't been disciples too long. It was early in their three-year internship, and they had witnessed some rather amazing things up until this point. Multitudes had been swarming to this little town of Capernaum, and Jesus had healed them all. They're, they're on that large, Capernaum was on the large lake that we call a sea, the Sea of Galilee. It's really not much of a sea. And Jesus had healed every disease. He had even healed a leper. And he told them about the kingdom, about how not to worry about anything because you were in the kingdom and God's going to take care of everything that you really need. So don't worry about that stuff. And then after that, two men come to Jesus and they go, hey, we'd like to follow you. And Jesus tells them about in order to be in the kingdom and to follow him, that the kingdom and the king have to be the most important things in your life. And everything else has to come after that. And these two guys are kind of afraid. And they say, I don't, I don't think I can do that, you know. And so they don't come and follow. But Matthew, uh, they, they get into a boat. And Matthew tells the story so easily. It says, Jesus got in the boat. And they followed him into the boat. And then this huge seismos, seismic storm comes up. And they got on the boat and they, I mean, they didn't think that this is going to be their, their last boat ride. I mean, this is just a boat ride like anything else. And they're, they're traveling with Jesus and they're on his team. And I mean, if you're traveling with Jesus, doesn't mean that, that the, the water is always, you know, crystal clear and that there, there's a rainbow maybe in the blue sky and that, you know, things are just beautiful for you because you're, you're traveling with Jesus and, and Jesus would be, uh, dressed in kind of an off-white robe with um, baby blue accents and his long brown hair would be flowing in the breeze, you know, framing his chiseled European appearance. Really good-looking guy there in the boat, right? That's the way we think it's supposed to be. 
Among other things with this story, we're confronted with the reality that when we get in the boat with Jesus, we're going to get wet. Disciples um, can expect, expect some great storms and expect some rough seas, and followers of Jesus are not excluded for life as we know it in life, there's going to be some storms. I don't care who you are, you're going to have some storms, storms that come on us suddenly. We who follow Jesus get into the boat with him, and, and we too will mourn the deaths of spouses and parents and children. And some of us will get those contagious diseases. And some of us will get cancer and we will, like everybody else, fight addictions, and we will suffer injustice like everyone else. And as a result, we're going to have to face our fears like everyone else faces their fears. See, the kingdom of God is not some kind of protective bubble and protect us from life. When we get in the boat with Jesus, we should expect some storms like everybody else has some storms. Um, and it's not the absence of the storm that sets us apart. It's who we find with us in the boat who's asleep in the midst of the storm that makes a difference. It says, but he was asleep. Really, asleep? How, how can you sleep at a time like this, Jesus? I mean, how does someone sleep through this gigantic storm that's rocking the boat and waves are coming in? I mean, either he's so uh, tired to the point that he's about, he's just sheer exhaust and he just passes out there in the stern of the boat. Or maybe, you know, maybe Jesus was at peace and in all the storms that come his way, Jesus is always, he's okay, he's at peace. Maybe it's both of those. Maybe he's really tired and he's at peace too, you know. But he gives us the assurance that if he is really living in us and we are really living in him, then in Christ, then we can be at peace in every storm that comes our way. But he's asleep. Jesus is asleep. He's asleep because he trusts in the Father. First church that I served was a little church down in Bloomfield. Not really a little church. It's a great church down in Bloomfield. You say little and it makes it sound like it's not a good church, but it's a good church down in Bloomfield. I was a student at seminary at the time, and God had sent me to that church to save all those people because somehow they would gotten all those uh, unchristian people were congregated into one congregation, and they all needed saving is what I was convinced. And So I was on like a four or five month evangelism. I'm being sarcastic here, you know, <laughs> looking back on, on what I was doing. But in the church, there's a really great man. I had a lot of great men in that church and women, but there's a guy named Charles T. McClaskey. Charles T. was a, was the little town's postmaster and respected by everybody in the town and was really the head elder in this church and, you know, a, a humble man. And I noticed after being there for a few months that any time the decision was to be made, they always went to Charles T. And he would either give a nod or a, say, I don't know if we ought to do that or not. And we all trusted Charles T. But as I was there, uh, oh, it probably been about a year, and uh, I noticed that Charles began sleeping through my sermons. He sat on the back pew with his wife and Carolyn, and Charles would fold his arms like this and then just put his head down. Just during the sermon, you know what it's like to have somebody just visibly go to sleep on you like this during the sermon. The only time it'd ever open up his eyes would be if I'd say, well, I probably shouldn't say this. Charles popped one eye open like that. Just, just about but one Sunday after, I don't, it's probably about a year after I'd been there and I was, everybody was filing out of the church and shaking hands and um, Charles said, Don, um, you notice that I, sleeping during your sermons and then oh boy here it comes i know i haven't been doing a very good job and he says the reason i go to sleep during your sermons because i trust you <laughs> he wasn't watching for me to do anything wrong i'd gotten to that level of trust and so he he then was using this as nap time for his for his sermons you know, and I understood exactly what he's saying maybe jesus was just trusting the the disciples here okay like, they got the boat, they can handle this, I can sleep. 
They don't need me up there in the stern looking out, going, oh, there's, there's a storm over there. I've got to rebuke that one. No, because they're okay. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, the Gospel of Mark adds something that Matthew left out. Mark 4.38 says, But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Okay, Jesus is in the front of the boat, asleep on a cushion, and when they awaken him, they accuse him of not caring. See, his peace is misunderstood as indifference or apathy, and they don't ask him if he has the power to stop the storm. They ask him, don't you care about the storm? They question his character. That's what they're questioning. Fear, this kind of shows us something. Fear has this power over us that when we're afraid, that we th- and we're thinking only of ourselves, we often think that God doesn't care. Fear distorts our minds. So the more insecure we get, the meaner that, w- that we become. And fear turns us into control freaks. When we're afraid, we'll lash out at anyone or anything that tries to take our control away because we're worrying about this really well. We've got this under control with our worry. And who do you think you are to tell us to have faith in this? But see, but while we do this, Jesus is in the boat. He's asleep and he's at peace. I mean, a few things we don't understand here. I, I still don't. And you just take a stab at, at one or the other. I mean, did Jesus think that the disciples would rebuke the storm for him? Because you see, I mean, there's rebuking the storm means that there's some evil in the storm. And some people, and I'm probably one of them, think that this was an attempt to end the life of Jesus by, for, by Satan before Jesus could get to Calvary. And there are a number of other places where there's an attempt on his life to stop him before he gets to Calvary. And so did Jesus think, well, these guys will take care of that because they're my faithful followers and they will just rise up and rebuke this. If something happens, it's okay. And I mean, that that's kind of the M.O. of Satan, uh, to, to stop something like that. So his statement about their lack of faith may be that he expected them to stand up to the evil and rebuke it. Or may, maybe his statement about their lack of faith is more about their fear. Were they to ride the storm out? Just, just you know, we're not going to sink, just, just go through it? Uh, we don't know. I don't know. I don't really know, you know which one it was. I do know that faith and fear can't share the same space. We can't have faith and fear at the same moment. It's oil and water. Uh, Faith kills fear and fear kills faith. One of them is going to win in us. We forget who God is and we forget that he's loving and that he's kind and he's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness towards us and the sudden terror can steal that faith away and we forget that Jesus is in the boat. When fear shapes our lives, Safety becomes our God, and anything that threatens our immediate safety takes the place of God. Now, I want you to pay attention how this turns out. The twelve are left in another kind of fear, kind of a healthy fear of God. After he speaks to the wind and the sea and all becomes calm, they are in awe of him. They said, who is this man? He speaks to the wind. He speaks to the sea, and they obey him. Could, could this Jesus, could he be God? Could he be that one? I mean, and they ride across the calm waters to their destination, but they never forget how God used this storm to open up their eyes to who Jesus really was. No more terror that day for them. Now they, the fear they have was a healthy fear for they are in awe of God in Jesus. It's good fear. That kind of fear, God tells us, opens us up to see the glory of God. Proverbs 9, 10. Most of you have heard this. Uh, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is insight. See that the storms served a purpose. They begin that day to see who Jesus is and they would never be the same. They would always look back and say, remember the storm? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that day. He's not just a prophet. He's just not another rabbi, not just a teacher. 
This guy is something beyond that. He might be God. And we, as, as we go through the storms of life, and there will be some storms that come our way, you know, we will be tempted with the terror to fear and to try to take control of everything. But if we will have a fear of God, it says that he will be glorified by the storm. That means that others will not only see how tough we are, they're going to see how big God is. He's able. He loves. Fear may fill our world, but it doesn't have to fill our hearts. It will always be among us, but it doesn't have to control us. Now, it's been said that, that Jesus gave 125 commands in the gospel accounts. 125 times he told them to do something. 21 times of those he says, don't be afraid. Take courage. Stand firm. 21 of the 125, 20% roughly. The, the second place, he said that more than anything else of the commands. The second place was that he tells us to love God and to love other people. Eight times he does that. Eight to 21. Jesus takes our fears very seriously. And he has he is, he is merely repeated what was said to the people from the first covenant in the Old Testament where over and over God says, stand firm, don't be afraid. You're going to see my glory. Let me do it. My, that's my battle. It's not your battle. Let me do it. So, so I wonder today, why am I afraid? Ask yourself that question. If you're going through a storm right now, you know, why am I afraid? See, am I living in the fear or am I living in the faith? Do I believe that Jesus cares and that he's powerful enough to do something about it? Now, I want to close here with just giving you a few more scriptures, just kind of give you a taste of what we're going, going into. Just a few of those 21 times. Uh, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. He says, so do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. It was a time where he told them not to worry about everyday things in life. He says, don't be afraid any longer. Only believe. He said, don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen to give you the kingdom. He says, take courage. Your sins are forgiven. He says, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. He says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And then he says, in the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Over and over again, Jesus tells his followers to not be afraid. Ready to receive that today? Let's, let's sit in prayer with it for a few minutes. As deep cries out